So today is with us Professor Christopher Cocker, director of LSC Ideas, one of the leading academic think tanks, and uh, also for many decades Professor in International Relations at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And several of his books have already been translated into Serbian, including The Twilight of the West, uh, Philosophers, Barbarians, and The Future of War. And today we are discussing uh, uh, some important issues from the international relations that are important for uh, the global community. Uh, and uh, the first question is uh, about his uh, <coughs> recently published book in 2019 entitled The Rise of the Civilizational State. So a relatively new phenomenon uh, Professor Cocker, that you have written a book about is the civilizational state. In your monograph published in 2019, you warn that the second decade of the 21st century, in the second decade of the 21st century, China and Russia began to view themselves as separate civilizations. So what is your definition of the civilizational state and what are its aims? Well, a civilization state is not a nation state. We still have nation states in the world. A civilization state is, of course, a nation, but it's larger than a nation, and its, its claims uh, to authenticity are pretty unique. If you go back to November 2021, the joint declaration by the Chinese and Russian ambassadors in Washington, this was at a time that the democracy summit was taking place in the United States, which Biden had promised he would um, convene should he be elected president. If you uh, look at that joint communique, you will see that they reject liberalism, they reject a rules-based international order. They say they want a polycentric world order. Now, polycentric just means that everybody does their own thing. China does its thing and Russia does its thing, and because they're very large powers, they are beyond criticism. Uh, and beyond the judgment uh, of organizations like the United Nations. So if you take human rights, which I think uh, Westerners would think are biologically grounded uh, or grounded in the stories we tell about human dignity, they would argue that this is a Western discourse which has been imposed upon the world mostly by force uh, that involves regime change and nation building, crusades and world wars. And they would argue, for example, human rights is a phenomenon of the 18th century European Enlightenment, the Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen. That's extremely important because, of course, the French said you could only have human rights if you were a citizen if the subject, who was subject to the king, became a citizen who was subject to his fellow citizens and no one else. So they would argue that that is a unique Western discourse that has no place uh, in Russian politics or Chinese politics or indeed in the politics of the international order. The specific distinctive features of civilization states are therefore value pluralism. There are different value systems in the world. There should be respect for each other's value systems on the basis of which you'll have peaceful coexistence. You can avoid war. The second aspect I think is extremely important and that is history. That you are grounding uh, your identity as a civilization state on a very specific reading of your own history. In the case of China, it's a narrative that goes back to the 20th century, uh, the century of humiliation, and the patriotic history courses that have uh, been introduced since the 1980s. In the case of Russia, it's about eliminating negative elements or criticisms of your own history and coming up with what the cultural ministry calls a mythology rather than a history. Uh, even to the point where you're claiming that professional historians have no right to write history books any longer because they're not telling the story that the state actually wants. And the third aspect, I think, is, is strangely enough genetic because it echoes the politics of the 1930s, is that countries have specific genes, or peoples of countries have specific genes, a genetic imprint that makes them different from other people. In the case of the Chinese, it would be called a set of wolf genes. We've heard of wolf diplomacy. Wolf genes are those genes they inherited from the barbarian invasions for, for two, two or three thousand years, intermingling with the Han Chinese 
uh, kind of capitalist genes which have always made Chinese a trading nation and a nation of merchants. And this unique combination of hard genes and soft genes makes China the power that it actually is. And in the case of Russia, you even have a couple of years ago the absurdity of uh, scientists identifying that Putin and his set from Leningrad, St. Petersburg today, inherited from their parents during the siege of Leningrad, the 900-day siege, a set of uh, genes that make them super patriotic. And of course, if you believe this nonsense, uh, of course, you give yourself uh, certain rights that other nations don't. It's a form of what I call cultural Darwinism. Um, so, the West is basically a group of nation states, and Russia, Russia's war on Ukraine, in a way, reinvented these states. But many Western intellectuals are very critical of nation states and view that concept as an obsolete and antiquarian polity. Since you define two major global players, China and Russia, as civilization states, then my question is if the collision of the two world views and two polities, liberal nation states and autocratic civilization states, is inevitable? Or could they accommodate themselves within a multipolar world? Well, you're right about the nation state uh, in terms of a uh, European understanding. The, when I say European, I mean an EU understanding of European values, for example. The nation state is still the principal unit in European uh, politics. It was the principal unit in the 2008 financial crisis. It was the principal unit in the COVID uh, pandemic crisis. Uh, everybody falls back on the nation state because there is not, nothing else to fall back upon. And that is certainly true of the European powers as well. But it's not the narrative. So if you go to the Museum of History in Brussels, five stories, you won't find a single reference to the nation state, even though the Europeans invented the nation state and it's been central to European history. You won't find a single reference to a great European leader, whether it's Winston Churchill or Charles de Gaulle or Conrad Adenauer or going even further back into history to the figures uh, at the time of the First World War. The only two people who are mentioned and are represented are Stalin and Hitler. Because the narrative is that we have to escape Stalinism and we have to escape Nazism and that's the purpose of the European Union specifically. The nation state is a bad thing. This is a complete misreading of European history and it's not particularly helpful since the EU cannot replace the nation state. Um, but that's the reality. So is there going to be, your second question really, sub-question, is, is there going to be a a battle between authoritarianism and democracy. That is what the United States would like the narrative to be, but uh, it's not going to happen. And 25 democracies have disappeared in the past 10 years, three of them in the West. Uh, we also, of course, have the prospect uh, of people like Narendra Modi, the Indian leader praised by Joe Biden for his commitment to democracy, who's busily shutting down democracy in, uh, in India. Um, you have uh, a set of democracies that are in the global south that are quite critical of Western democracies. So I don't think there's going to be an ideological struggle. The authoritarian regimes are more, ideological fle more ideologically flexible than the democracies and that they're quite happy to, to work with anyone um, if it's for their joint or common interests. Not so the democracies that seem to be very judgmental countries like Saudi Arabia and Erdogan's Turkey and others. I mean, the democracies are just going to have to go into step, I'm afraid, if they want to, to fight. Um, it's not going to be an ideological battle. What we're seeing is a pluralistic world, a multipolar system. The United States is in decline. The rules-based system can't be supported much longer. And it's just going to be a series of deals that are going to have to be worked out between countries against common enemies. So it means that there will be global zones of interest and this brings us to the question of the 21st century as the Pacific century. So what does it mean for the European Union? Will it be a major global player or not? Well, I, we don't talk in the West about the Pacific century any longer. I mean, first of all, it's a very Western concept that uh, a single country uh, mints 
the century and, and, and says the 19th century was the British century or the 18th century in Europe was the French century. Um, this is a Hegelian idea, Hegel's idea that history moves westwards and that it starts in China and it ends up either in Europe in the 19th century at the apex of human progress, or possibly he even conceded it could end up in the United States, uh, being a good 19th century German. He had very little uh, understanding of the United States or indeed interest in what was happening in the New World. But of course, if history continues to move westwards, why should it move across the Pacific to China? Uh, there was a time when, if you remember, the Americans were concerned that Japan was going to become the number one power in the 1980s. It was always an absurd uh, proposition, but unfortunately for them, China could very well become the number one power. But I don't think that this idea of centuries uh, is, is a very, very useful one. Um, the second point I would make is that it's not the Pacific that is the central geopolitical fulcrum, it's the Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean is twice the much uh, number, the amount of trade uh, goes through the Indian Ocean than across the Pacific. Uh, China gets 80% of its energy via the Indian Ocean from, of course, the Persian Gulf. Uh, India is, sees itself very much as the power of the Indian Ocean. And if you're looking there at the investments that are being made in, for example, the AUKUS agreements or the Quad or whatever it might be, the Indian Ocean is the geopolitical fulcrum. So if we're going to talk about any ocean, it's got to be that ocean. I think the days of the Pacific Ocean are probably behind us. But where is the EU in the whole... Uh... Well, the EU uh, is there because it's investing some of its resources. The French have an Indian Ocean presence. Um, the European Union is interested, of course, has to be interested. Uh, but we're talking about a couple of ships, no more than that. Again, speaking of the um, current situation in Russia's war on Ukraine, uh, this brings, uh, there are different voices in the European Union, like the one uh, made by the French president. So, how do you see uh, the EU's uh, foreign policy? Is it going to be unanimous or is it going to be multipolar itself? Well, if military power is becoming increasingly important, and the Stockholm Institute for Peace Research, CIPRI, published a report recently to say that military expenditure by um, powers, by great powers and by medium powers, is higher now than at any time since the end of the Cold War. And if the great powers are preparing, uh, at least gaming, let's put it that way, for war against each other, which the United States and China most certainly have been doing for the past few years, um, which we've been doing with Russia since 2014 and the Crimea crisis, uh, there's not much place for an organization like the European Union, which by definition is what used to be called a civilian power, not a mili military power. And you can go to Macron's idea of strategic autonomy for Europe, but it's a complete non-starter because the Europeans do not have the will to be strategically autonomous and they don't actually have the resources. They're not going to spend four or five percent of their budget uh, on defense. They're simply not going to do that. And the European people would not permit their governments to spend so much money on defense. So the Europeans remain entirely tied to the transatlantic world uh, and to the United States. In fact, their dependence on America has become manifest since the beginning of this war uh, uh, over a year ago. There's no place uh, for, for the EU in this kind of world, which is why you have a number of European leaders, the Spanish Prime Minister a couple of weeks ago in Beijing, saying Taiwan, for example, is not our concern. Um, and if you ask the Poles, who are of course totally committed to Ukraine winning this war against Russia, Taiwan is of no concern to them either. It's just Russia and nothing else. And Russia will remain a resentful, um, pretty powerless but dangerous uh, country for the foreseeable future and the Europeans will be completely preoccupied with defending themselves against uh, what's becoming a rogue state more and more. So uh, I suppose if, if you look at it from that point of view the United States is on its own when it comes to Taiwan and the Europeans may find themselves on their own when it comes to Russia in the years to come and let's see what they make of that. Um, in several of your works, you suggested that the end of the war is far from being possible in the near future. 
one year after the beginning of Russia's war on Ukraine, it seems that there are many other neuralgic spots around the globe. Is it likely that in the near future humanity may witness other wars? And judging by your books, it is, but I still need to ask the question. Well, there was this hope at the end of the Cold War that somehow we'd emerged from this era of great power conflict. Uh, and if you read books such as Stephen Pinker's Better Angels of Our Nature or Enlightenment Now, or John Horgan, the former editor of Scientific American's book, The End of War, whose title gives you, I think, a good indication of what this hypothesis is, um, you will be very comforted by the fact that war was a thing of the past. Certainly great power conflict was a thing of the past. Unfortunately, this has not turned out to be the case. Um, if you'd actually read Enlightenment Now in 2017 when it was published, you'd also have been told by the author Stephen Pinker that thanks to the wonders of uh, modern medicine, there would be no further global pandemics. Now, of course, we're told by epidemiologists that there will be a lot of pandemics this century, many more coming our way, perhaps in the next 10 years will be the next big one, and that this is going to also be the age of global climate change in the same way the 20th century was the war of, was the age of revolution and total war. Of course revolution and total war were intimately interlinked and global climate change and pandemics are interlinked. And global climate change is going to give rise to conflicts over resources, particularly water resources. The world is getting short of fresh water. Um, a near conflict between Ethiopia and Egypt uh, some years ago, what's happening in Sudan is, is partly powered by water shortages and droughts. In fact, the conflict in, in, South, in Darfur, which led to the independence of South Sudan, was the first war of global climate change. And the civil war in uh, Syria, which has claimed the lives of 750,000 people at least, was caused by a four-year drought, which was the longest in the country's history, with lots of Syrians leaving the countryside and going to the cities where there was no work for them, uh, and of course having a government that wasn't interested in providing work for them, hence uh, civil war. You may have more civil wars than you have wars between countries, but you will see the breakdown of societies uh, in what we call the developing world pretty soon and pretty quickly. And finally, what are your views on the position of the United Kingdom three years after it officially left uh, European Union. Opinion polls suggest that uh, the majority of citizens of the UK now consider Brexit a mistake. Yes, well, it was, of course, a classic mistake. Uh, and that mistake was brought to us by 850,000 people. That was the difference. The margin is very small for a population of uh, nearly 70 million people. Uh, and it's uh, one of the great disasters of. Uh, of British history in the same way that the Suez Crisis in 1856 was a disaster. That meant the end of Britain as a world power, and Brexit is the end of Britain as a significant power of importance to anyone. As the uh, owner of Ryanair said the other day, of course we're rejoining the European Union, but we have to wait for this present generation to die, uh, unfortunately. And that's exactly what's going to happen, assuming the European Union is around in 40 years' time. But we will definitely be rejoining, if, if we're allowed to rejoin, of course. So this is uh, its manifest uh, uh, own goal, as we say, because Britain was getting everything it wanted from the European Union. The language was English, uh, deepening had come to an end. It was all about widening, bringing even more countries into the European Union and weakening it from within. Uh, you also had Britain as the interlocutor between the United States and the European Union. That role has gone, which is why American presidents are not really interested in the United Kingdom any longer. Uh, what is there to show? And even in terms of these great trade agreements, none of which have been signed or have been signed with one or two countries. So the, uh, the Australian agreement, the free trade agreement with Australia, it's 3% of our trade. And the idea of uh, Singapore on the Thames, a global hub, which is going, would be dynamic and growing, is a complete uh, uh, um, illusion. Delusion, not illusion. So yes, uh, a total and utter disaster. There is no positive aspect to Brexit whatsoever. Thank you very much for your answers, Professor Cocker.